The question I'm going to um, be addressing today is should you get paid to protect the environment? How many, I can't really see you, but how many University of Chicago students do we have here today? Okay, so for those of you who are students here at the University of Chicago, getting paid to do something like protect the environment probably doesn't sound that foreign. But perhaps to other people, it's not the way that we traditionally think about environmental management. So generally we think that if you are a polluter, and we often think of polluters as big corporations, um, if you pollute, then you should pay for it. Right? The polluter pays principle is what we hear. But what we're going to do today, or right now, is think about this a little bit differently by acknowledging that each and every one of us can be a polluter, probably is a polluter. Each and every one of us can protect the environment. We can take actions to protect the environment. So the question is, should you get paid to do that? Well, I'm going to address four questions. Why should you get paid to protect the environment? Who should get paid to protect the environment? How can I get paid to protect the environment? And but wait, should we really pay people to protect the environment? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. First question, why? Well, protecting the environment creates what we call economic value. And value has a lot of different definitions. In economics, value means that people care about it. OK, so if we take this doctored picture of the Amazon here, um, we see that the Amazon has all this economic value. It provides tourism and recreation opportunity. But it also provides economic value through, through other things, like carbon storage, right? We hear a lot about rainforest protection for, for carbon storage, for endangered species habitat protection, for water storage, right? We hear about all of these things that we care about. We as a society, we as people care about, it has economic value. If we lose those services from the Amazon, we try to replace them in other ways which costs us money, right? So that's one way we can think about it. This is obviously not exclusive to large famous ecosystems like the Amazon, um, take, our, uh, take the Gulf or our coasts, right? Protecting our coastal wetlands provides valuable water storage. It keeps us from, from experiencing um, too many droughts. It prevent, prevents us from um, being too vulnerable to storm surges, a lot of fisheries production, all very valuable economic services. But let's start with even smaller. Let's say you live in Chicago and you plant a tree on your property. Does that protect the environment? Sure. Planting a tree provides shade, it provides habitat, it stores carbon dioxide, it controls temperature, all things which we are, think are valuable services. It provides value to you as the person who planted the tree, but maybe also to your neighbors and to other people as well. So why should you get paid to the protect environment? The way we think about it in economics is, well, you're providing a good or a service. OK, maybe not oranges or milk, but you are providing a good or service by protecting the environment. You are the producer or the supplier, and you're bearing the cost. It costs you to plant that tree. There's some benefit to you as well, otherwise you probably wouldn't do it, right? But there's benefit to other people out there who don't pay for it. So you're providing them, these other people, the community, society, with a good or a service. Another reason why you should get paid to protect the environment, well, you might not protect it otherwise. right? So the incentive to protect the environment um, is increased through a financial instrument. OK, so say any, like anything else that you spend your money or your time on, you expect some return on investment. And this is not just a financial investment. It's like if you go to the store and you buy a cup of coffee, you expect a cup of coffee in return, a good one even, right? So when am I going to protect the environment if there's no return on that investment to me or if that return on investment is too small? It doesn't justify the cost of planting the tree. But it provides benefit to all these other people. Am I going to do that? Take these rain barrels, for example. And if you can see this picture. So what these rain barrels do is they collect the rainwater that falls and comes out through your downspout. It keeps that rainwater from running across our paved surfaces and into our waterways and dragging all that junk that's on the, on the roads with it. So it protects water quality. It keeps the rainwater out of our sewer system so it doesn't have to get treated like sewage water, which is expensive, and it's clean water, presumably falling from the sky. Would you put these rain barrels on your property? If it lowered your water bill, maybe. In mo ca most cases, it probably won't for various reasons. Um, if it kept your basement from flooding, you would. In many cases, most cases, it probably won't either. <laughs> it might keep your neighbor's property from flooding or your neighbor's basement from flooding because your property lines don't, or don't coincide necessarily with the hydrological system, right? 
So if it prevents your neighbor's basement from flooding, are you going to pay to put these rain barrels on and maintain them and dump them out and put them away every winter? Maybe. There might be reasons why you might do that. Um, you might be more likely to do it if you get paid. So the question is, who should get paid and how? First of all, who will pay? Well, presumably the people, these other people that are benefiting would pay for it, right? So take, for example, um, a river, right? And upstream here you've got industry and they're polluting and you've got agriculture and farmers and, and they're, they're using nutrients and, and it's all running off into the water, going down the river and affecting the fishermen and the tour boat operators down below, right? So presumably those people down below would pay the people up here not to do that or to use different practices so that they don't suffer um, losses in, in their livelihoods. So that's an example. Maybe your neighbors, the neighbors whose basements no longer flood, would pay to have rain barrels installed in all the properties up here at the top of the hill. Who's going to get paid? Well, people are already getting paid. So a lot of these payment programs evolved in the developing world, where conservation programs taking land out of agricultural production, for example, was found to be in conflict with poverty alleviation. Taking land out of production from subsistence farmers, subsistence fishermen, for example, was reducing the income that they had or the subsistence they had to, that they survived on. So payments were given to compensate them for that lost income. Okay, so who will get paid? Um, that's an example from the developing world. We have exa many examples in this country. Right? We've got um, conservation pro programs in agriculture. We've got rebates for energy efficient appliances. We've got subsidies for renewable energy. We've got all kinds of examples of who will get paid. How will I get paid? Well, do you, can you imagine a situation where the downstream fishermen in the Gulf offered to pay the industry of the farmers upstream? Can you imagine a situation where your neighbors offered to pay you for better landscape management practices? Generally not. Generally we'll see these negotiations made through a lot of lawyers and litigation, right? But if we think that there are a lot, enough providers of environmental protection, each and every one of us, and there's enough demanders of environmental protection, each and every one of us, we might be able to create sort of a marketplace for environmental protection as opposed to a lot of lawyers and litigation. Um, but this market needs a lot of ground rules to work, and many other things. What about government? How necessary is government? So in the political world, you don't hear too many candidates arguing for more government for environmental protection, right? Um, but in many cases with environmental protection, the beneficiaries are many and diffuse, right? There's a lot of different beneficiaries, so it takes some kind of central government action to ensure that all these people are benefiting from the environmental protection. However, alternatively, what the government can do is lay these ground rules that we were just talking about, called property rights. The government can say, who has the right to pollute, how much you are able to pollute, where you can pollute, and also create the framework so that people can demand and supply environmental protection. So we think that this might work because we have evidence from the Clean Air Act that trading can reduce environmental pollution. We see markets evolving for greenhouse gases, but the greenhouse gases need these ground rules. They need government regulations before we see any kind of tr viable trading. We're seeing markets emerge for nutrient management in agriculture, for stormwaters I just mentioned with the rain barrels, for critical habitat protection, for wetlands protection. But wait, are there any problems with paying people to protect the environment? Instead of the polluter making the polluter pay, paying people not to pollute? Are there problems with this? Well, the cynic, maybe the cynic is the economist, I'm not sure. Um, but wait, I can get paid to protect the environment, so why would I do it for free? I might have been willing to do it for free, but now that you're offering to pay me, I'm going to wait until I can get paid. In this case, the amount that you get paid is not, you're not getting paid for the benefits to yourself of protecting the environment. You're getting paid for the benefits you're giving to other people. 
Okay, so that payment really is to get you to go above and beyond the level of environmental protection afforded by your own return on investment. Okay, so we don't want to prevent people from, from doing what they would have done otherwise. Second, there has to be, in any kind of program like this, there has to be a baseline. You can't create more waste and then clean it up and get paid, right? It doesn't, it doesn't um, increase our overall level of environmental protection. So there needs to be a baseline in order to even get into a situation or a market where you can be involved in trading, you have to first meet that level of environmental protection. First meet that level of pollution reduction, then you can go above and beyond again, as we were saying. But wait, maybe I will just protect the environment because I care about other people. I want people to, it makes me feel better when people have a cleaner earth, have breathable air, have drinkable water. I want people to have that. That's my altruistic vision. That, in, that gives me economic value, that gives me economic satisfaction. Right, we would count that as part of your return on investment. We wouldn't pay you for that, okay? Or, but wait, I'm not an altruist. Some people in economics believe altruists don't exist. Uh, I'm an egoist. I don't really care if you have clean air, clean water, but being an environmental steward makes me feel good about myself. Well, that, again, gives you economic value. That's part of your return on investment. You shouldn't get paid for that. That's something that you would do otherwise. But wait, aren't I morally obligated to protect the environment? What about morals and ethics? Perhaps, many people will feel this way. Can we rely on it? And this maybe then goes back to the cynic who would say, well, some people may, feel, may for whatever reason be more, feel morally responsible to pollute, or, or less directly, morally responsible to provide as much food as possible to feed the earth, regardless of environmental outcomes. To provide as much energy as possible so we can all live like we do in this country, regardless of environmental outcomes. So relying on morals, it's difficult to achieve a certain level of environmental protection. So I wanna leave you, I guess, with a question instead of a conclusion. Given all this, can we trust the economic way to protect the environment? Thinking in terms of benefits and costs and payments, does that economically, what we would call efficient way to protect the environment, achieve the ecologically important or critical level of environmental protection? Does it achieve social goals related to human health and the quality of life, poverty? Can we incorporate these ecological and social goals into our economic world of benefits and costs? What about the future? Economics. Can it handle the long run? Or are we all short-term thinkers? How do we protect against what might happen in the future? Does that ever win a benefit-cost comparison with spending the money today on something else? So the question that I am gonna leave you with in my short talk is, can economics, can we trust economics to protect the environment? Some people would argue yes, if enough people care about it. Thank you.